I've been uh, looking forward to uh, this presentation, and it's it's always a pleasure to speak about uh, the Los Angeles Public Library and. Uh, really, as the presentation says, the power of libraries and the great work that uh, we do in Los Angeles, but that great work is happening in small public libraries and small towns and suburban areas and urban areas as well all across the country. Uh, libraries are, are very dynamic, incredibly relevant today. And the book, the library book by Susan Orlean, which I'll, I'll speak about uh, as well, is uh, I, I look at it as a gift to libraries. You know, she uh, is an incredible writer. She uh, wrote notably The Orchid Thief. Um, perhaps some of you have read that about uh, the sort of zany uh, orchid world in Florida. And she has the ability to do a deep dive into a subject matter that perhaps from a distance might not, uh, you, you might wonder the, what the, the, the uh, story might be, but uh, she really makes it uh, enlightening and she has a wonderful sense of humor and so when she came to us here in LA to uh, begin working um, on the book she um, let's see if I can advance there we go um, and here is the central library the subject uh, of her of her book she uh, you know we were we were excited that someone of her stature and an author obviously those of us in the library were certainly familiar with her and her books uh, we were, uh, I would say, uh, worried in a healthy way <laughs> as to what what she might write about, and uh, certainly we're hoping that it would be a, a positive uh, look at our library. And you know, she didn't know the vehicle or the mechanism with which she would use to tell the story of the library. Ultimately, she centered on the fire and some of the uh, really interesting stories around the fire, the mystery of the fire. And, uh, but using that as a vehicle, she told the story of uh, libraries today. And that is really what the, 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 the gift of the book to libraries is that the people who read it, hopefully many of you did, uh, really not only learn about this fascinating history of the LA Public Library and the Central Library Fire, but they also learn about all of the incredible, dynamic, exciting uh, things that libraries are doing today. And that we are very much the library of your parents and your grandparents and your great grandparents, all those great things and with the collections and books and story times and helping people with research and a quiet place to read. We are all of those things, uh, but also our libraries do so much more today to have an impact on the communities they serve. And I am uh, at this moment in Central Library in the heart of downtown Los Angeles. The background behind me, as I was mentioning, earlier before the program started is not a, an artificial Zoom background, it is real, I'm in my office and uh, it's uh, great to be here. We are open, a limited uh, portion of our central library is open right now to the public and uh, many of our branches are and we're in the process of a, a phased reopening where I think by mid-June all of our libraries will be open again to the public. And this is a wonderful, wonderful photograph in the foreground are uh, McGuire Gardens which are uh, beautiful landscape gardens with public art that were um, designed around the original, and I'll be speaking about this in a little bit, but around the original garden design here uh, that uh, when the building was built in the 1920s, uh, and then when the building was renovated and added onto, there was a new landscape design uh, that, that was built upon that original design, and that is what uh, you see some of here in the foreground. And then, of course, in the background is the majestic, iconic uh, LA Central Library, which is a much loved building and a much loved institution, uh, the public library here in LA. It is uh, also an example of a, a real victory when it comes to historic preservation in Los Angeles. Uh, LA certainly has a number of buildings that it's preserved, but I wouldn't say the city is uh, known for uh, its, its uh, preservation always uh, when, when people think about LA and speak about LA. And so the fact that this building, which opened in 1926, uh, it survives to this day. We uh, a few years ago celebrated the 90th uh, birthday of the building and soon uh, we'll be celebrating the 100th birthday um, in, a, in a few years. Uh, it's uh, really a remarkable building. It, it's uh, uh, was built during a, uh, the uh, Art Deco period. There are many Art Deco elements to it. 
uh, Spanish revival uh, and so much exterior sculpture. And then the, the original design for the building, the architect was Bertram Goodhue, was uh, a dome. And then later uh, it was decided that it would be a, a pyramid. And you see an incredible mosaic tile work on the top of the pyramid there. And then uh, a torch and a hand that represents the light of learning, which is a, a broader theme for the art, public art and architecture of the of the entire building. And then of course, uh, Susan Orlean. Susan is of course on the left there, that she's actually in, <laughs> didn't know, she's, in my she was in my office for that photo. We did a, a little podcast where she and I spoke and uh, I interviewed her uh, back when the, the book came out. And on the right uh, is, is uh, Reese Witherspoon who wonderfully selected the book uh, as, as one of her book club selections. And Reese Witherspoon, the actress, uh, is huge in the book world. She is has a tremendous following. And when she, she's, I wouldn't say as big as Oprah, but in that vein where when she picks a, a book uh, for her book club, uh, sales go through the roof. And when she picked this book, uh, the library book climbed back up the bestseller list. And uh, we, were, we were certainly delighted with that. But uh, Susan is, uh, was incredible. It was a great experience. She was with us for a few years. Uh, I remember saying you have complete access, talk to our staff in all areas. And I was really pleased that she didn't just speak with me or the leadership of the library. She went, as for those of you who've read the book, she went to our loading dock and talked to our uh, uh, drivers who move books uh, and materials all around the city between our 72 branch libraries and our central library. She talked to our security staff, our librarians who had been here and were here during the fire, which I think contributed quite a bit to the book. And um, it was, um, it was a, a, just a, a real pleasure working with her and uh, getting an idea of what the book would become as, as each month passed that she worked on it and uh, as it came to closer to publication. We actually did the book launch uh, for the library book. Of course, where else would you have it? Here at Central Library. Uh, this is Susan uh, signing books. Uh, we had um, quite a few people here, obviously, for the for the uh, book launch, and uh, so special uh, to have her here in the building. Uh, we we also celebrated around the time of the book launch the 25th anniversary of the reopening of the library after the fire. That occurred in uh, 1993, and so we we did a big celebration of a series of events. And this launch of the book fit nicely uh, into that celebration. Incidentally, the, 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 you see Susan there with the cake and me. Uh, the woman on the left-hand side of the photograph is Christina Rice. She is the curator of our photo collection, which is our largest special collection at the library. And she was very helpful to uh, Susan Orlean. Uh, we have 3.4 million images in the collection, and they are used by uh, publishers, film, television, uh, really an incredible documentation of the history of Los Angeles and Southern California. And then the gentleman in the black sweater on the right side of the photograph next to Susan is Norman Pfeiffer. And Norman Pfeiffer was in this building the day of the fire. And he's mentioned in the book, uh, he was uh, with uh, the head of Central Library at the time. And he is the architect who uh, ultimately designed the new wing that was added onto the Central Library and uh, also the architect uh, for the renovation of the historic building as well. So when it comes to the architecture of Central Library uh, here at LAPL in downtown Los Angeles, uh, two names uh, are associated with that. Bertram Goodhue, the architect of the, the original building, and then Carlton Wins Winslow, I should add, uh, followed uh, when, when Bertram Goodhue passed away, Carlton uh, Winslow uh, followed. And then Norman Pfeiffer, of course, with the, the incredible uh, new, new building. Uh, a very uh, sad uh, and uh, emotional photograph even to this day uh, of the day in April of 1986 when uh, this was the largest library fire that had uh, occurred uh, up to that date. Uh, fortunately, uh, no one was uh, uh, seriously injured in the fire, uh, no one lost their life, uh, and fortunately the entire building uh, was not destroyed. However, uh, there was tremendous damage uh, that is documented in the book, and also uh, about 400,000 volumes 
uh, were lost. And so uh, it took uh, all day to, to put this fire out. The current fire chief in LA, uh, Chief Terrazas, was actually a, a entry-level firefighter that day. And uh, his job was operating one of the large industrial fans that was used later in the day to pull smoke out of the building. And uh, he remembers that day incredibly well. I'll also say that the fire and the, the aftermath of it was a real bringing together of Los Angeles. People rallied around the library. There had been a lot of debate about the Central Library. There were some leaders in the community that actually wanted to demolish the Central Library and relocate it to another place. And the community came together around the preservation of this building and its restoration. And they also came together around helping the library uh, move the books out of the building, uh, raising money for uh, the renovation of the building. There was a telethon, which those of you who've read the book, uh, it's certainly mentioned in the book, a telethon with celebrities uh, participating. And it was just a beautiful LA story with people rallying around and supporting the library and its, uh, and its recovery, uh, which, which took a few years. But uh, the day of that reopening is, is a much storied day in LA Public Library history and uh, with, with so many people there and the building reopening again and, um, and it continues to be popular to this day. Here Susan is and that's one of her earliest memories of uh, coming to the library and, and asking questions about the fire was uh, understanding that there were still many books in our collection that had been here during the fire and uh, there there for some of those books, there's even a remaining scent of the, the smoke or, or physical evidence of some of the, the water damage uh, as indicated in one of the, the older volumes that, that she, she has here. Um, there is a story in the library book by Susan Orlean uh, around a piece of public art that was part of the original public art uh, of the building and its adjacent gardens in 19 in the 1920s. And that, that piece of art is called The Well of the Scribes. And she speaks about it in the book. And there is a, a relevance uh, and, a, and a subsequent story that occurred after the book was published. And it's one of my favorite stories to tell now. And uh, the, the story goes that uh, Lee Lawry, who was the one of the most renowned sculptors uh, in the 1920s, uh, did some uh, really uh, iconic Art Deco sculpture that's uh, in New York and did uh, all of the e exterior sculpture here at Central Library, uh, the magnificent chandelier, which was on the first slide in, in the presentation. It's a globe chandelier featuring the signs of the zodiac around it and uh, other uh, 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 marble sculpture inside the building. And he also created pieces for the gardens that were uh, immediately adjacent to Central Library. And one of those pieces was the Well of the Scribes. And the Well of the Scribes was a fountain. And you see it here in this historic photo. Um, it was a, a bronze fountain. Uh, and this, this piece in the front, this long, uh, this wide piece, was a curved bronze wall, if you will, that, that uh, was on the outer edge of the fountain. And then behind that wall was a, a pool of water. And then there was another bronze piece there on the short wall, uh, a spout, if you will, where the water came into the basin. And this well of the scribes fit into the overall iconographic theme of the building of light of learning. Uh, there were scribes uh, from the West, Western culture, scribes from the East, uh, a, a Phoenician scribe, a Greek scribe, uh, and, um, and just a, a beautiful relief there uh, on this, uh, on this uh, bronze well. Well, uh, in the 1960s, if you can believe it, these beautiful gardens with these beautiful Italian cypress trees that lined the promenade that led up to the int main entrance of the library, uh, the entire gardens were demolished, uh, bulldozed, uh, and this piece was bulldozed with it, and it was all to make way for a surface parking lot. We loved sur surface parking lots in the 1960s, and it was a parking lot that was intended for staff 
parking for the library. And uh, in, in the years hence, those who cared about the building and, and historic preservation mused as to and wondered and fretted around what happened to the well of the scribes. And as we formed a docent group and have docent tours that give wonderful tours of the building, speaking about its art and architecture, both inside the building as well as in the gardens, um, uh, have, have speak about this, this mystery of what happened to, to the well of the scribes. And uh, the, when the building was renovated after the 1986 fire and reopened in 1993, the parking lot was then demolished and the gardens were added back. There is actually a 1200 space parking garage beneath the gardens. And then these new gardens, which are known now as the McGuire Gardens, were placed on top of the parking garage. And as I mentioned earlier, that original design from 1926 was carried over a, a bit uh, into, the, uh, into, the new, um, into the new design. And so here's another uh, photograph. This is a historic photograph from the 1920s that also shows the well of the scribes. And you can see that well in the, in the front there. And you see a, a young woman in a, in a very classic 1920s outfit there uh, posing next to the well of the scribes. And then you see these three cascading pools that um, are, are there uh, with the Italian cypress lining up. Uh, to the main entrance of the library and uh, just a, a beautiful, beautiful photograph. And then this is the photograph of these gardens today. And um, uh, you see that there, uh, there are new fountain basins and the tile that lines the, the pools is a little different today, but absolutely glorious, beautiful. The, the theme of the Italian Cyprus uh, is continued here. Uh, but this story continued, and I am someone who loves historic preservation. I, I consider being the steward of this building a, a, an enormously re important responsibility, not only in my role as city librarian, but just a, a city resident. And uh, it's uh, the, the story of the Well of the Scribes is something that was uh, very interesting to me. And so uh, always wondered and had many conversations actually about where that uh, well of the scribes might be. And uh, a little over a year ago, or uh, maybe about a year, almost two years now, um, I got a call and my office got a call and it was from a, a gentleman named Floyd and he lived in, a, in Bisbee, Arizona. And I don't know if any of you know where Bisbee, Arizona is, but it's a actually a, a, a quite lovely little small town in southeastern Arizona. I'd say about a 40 minute drive south of Tucson, between Tucson and the Mexican border. And he owned an antique shop. And he said uh, that he thought he might have the well of the scribes. And so, uh, of course, we asked for some photos. He sent a photo. I thought, my goodness, this photo looks like it very well might be the well of the scribes. About a week later, I got on a plane. I flew to Tucson. I got in a car, drove down to Bisbee, Arizona, and uh, I made my way into his antique shop. Well, uh, I, I went into the antique shop and Floyd lives above the antique shop. And we went up the stairs into his tiny little apartment above the antique shop. And in his bedroom, because this was a very precious item, he kept this bronze piece. I walked into his bedroom and this is a photograph of, <laughs> a moment after I went into the bedroom and Floyd's bed is there on the right. I fell on the ground after the, you know, this bronze had been missing for 50 years and there it was. Uh, to, to lay eyes on it and to lay my hands on it was quite an amazing uh, experience. Uh, and here is Floyd and me uh, taking a picture with it. Floyd also, by the way, had invited the local newspaper photographer <laughs> to be there and take a photo of us with it. And, uh, it. and this actually is about half of the well. And so there is still another half missing. And we have spent enormous amounts of time asking and interviewing Floyd about where he got this piece. It, he bought it about uh, five, six years earlier from uh, a woman in a nearby town in Arizona 
who had this uh, in her garden and he remembers dragging it through her garden it being very heavy and loading it onto his pickup truck and bringing it back to his antique shop. And uh, when we were able to uh, bring it back to Los Angeles, we arranged for an art mover to come back. We had, of course, as we do in LA, a big press event uh, for it. Uh, you see a little bit better photograph of it. Uh, there's some stains here and there, but overall it's in very, very good condition. Uh, the uh, woman on the left-hand side of the photograph is Susan Broman, our assistant city librarian. Uh, next to me is Kren Malone, the director of Central Library, and on the right is uh, uh, the president of our library commission, our library board, Vic Nakao. And it's, uh, it was such a celebration. And of course, we are very eager to find where the remainder of the uh, well of the scribes is. And so a local publication that did an article about about this um, offered a $10,000 reward. Now we still haven't found it. So if this piece looks familiar to you and you think you might know where the other half is, by all means, give me a call, send me an email. Uh, we, would, we would love to know. But uh, I, I offer this because it's an incredible story. It's wonderful to have this piece back. It is in our rare books room right now. If we're able to find the other piece, we'll work with a designer and an architect to figure out a way to incorporate it back into the building. And it's also special because this Well of the Scribes was part of the library book by Susan Orlean. And the fact that it was mentioned in the library book and this little story of the well was mentioned in a magazine article uh, that referenced the book is one of the reasons why this came onto Floyd's radar screen and why he made the connection uh, between this piece that he had in his antique shop in Bisbee, Arizona, and the Los Angeles Public Library. So uh, we are delighted to have it back. And, and as the pandemic has progressed, I, I know the first time I came back into the library for the first time, I remember going to the Rare Books Room just to make certain it was still, still here because we certainly don't want uh, this piece uh, to be lost again. And so uh, just to continue on, I, I do want to also mention just some of the great work that we do at the LA Public Library. And then I, I also am looking forward to your, your questions uh, about the book and about the library. Uh, I mentioned that the library is all of those things that uh, we remember uh, from our childhood. We, we do great story times. We have uh, great children's books. Uh, we circulate uh, almost 15 million books a year. We're moving physical books from location to location. We also have science programs that you see here. Uh, these images are from our maker space and a maker fair that we had here at Central Library, where we do lots of programming around science and technology, engineering, arts and math. The photograph in the upper middle is a, a patron who's putting on a, 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 a virtual reality uh, headset um, and, uh, just really great, great programming at the library. And then here's uh, just a, a warm, fuzzy image, a great example of uh, just a traditional library program, kids coming to uh, story time at uh, one of our branch libraries. This is the Hyde Park Miriam Matthews Branch Library. And then um, the item above is a reminder that we uh, are for everyone and we're for all ages. We have a great lapsit story times. It's important to read to infants. And we emphasize that, have a great program around that. Uh, and then uh, another uh, very cute photo of uh, one of our young patrons with a, a circulating kit um, that is called LA Plays. And it's, it's not just, it's about uh, checking out not just the book, but also other uh, toys and items that might help uh, tell the story of, of the book. And then this is just a, a bit of an introductory slide about the Los Angeles Public Library. We are the public library system that serves the city of Los Angeles. And so we serve uh, about 4 million residents, 470 square miles, a very large geography, very large library system. There are actually 22 other public library systems in Los Angeles County. Uh, the county system serves all the unincorporated areas and many of the municipalities that don't have their own libraries. But there are municipalities like Pasadena and Beverly Hills and Torrance and Long Beach that have their own public library systems. And this is a map uh, of the city of Los Angeles, the unusual geography of the city. And the different colors there are the, how we divide uh, the, the city into different regions, 
and we, we manage our branch libraries with regional directors and then each of the branches, of course, has their own branch manager. So at the top, you see the San Fernando Valley, the east and west side. Uh, the orange is the, the west side. The, the yellow is the Hollywood area. Northeast LA and downtown is purple. And then this uh, very unusual shaped geography in green is South Los Angeles. And then the city of LA goes all the way down to the port of Los Angeles with uh, the communities of San Pedro and Wilmington and Harbor City, Harbor Gateway, uh, down by the Palos Verdes Peninsula. So 73 libraries, it's a big operation. We have uh, 1,600 full-time and part-time staff uh, who, who work throughout our library system. And then we're uh, open uh, seven days a week at about 11 of our libraries and all of the remainder of our libraries are open six days a week. Also, incidentally, we have over 6 million items in our collection, so a tremendous collection and people at the northernmost part of our city or southernmost part of our city and, and anywhere else in between can request materials that might be on the shelf at any of those libraries and they can get it just in a matter of uh, two or three days and that's, um, that's a, a great benefit we think of, of the system. We have a number of really unique and special initiatives. Uh, one is the New Americans Initiative, and this was established uh, soon after I arrived, and it is uh, began as a way to assist people who are legally eligible to become U.S. citizens take their first step on the path to citizenship, providing them with information about the test, information about the form, uh, assistance in how to do that, and the, the program has evolved to become a program that helps people with all sorts of issues around immigration. We have language learning classes to help people uh, learn English and uh, English language discussion. And uh, it's just a fantastic uh, program. You see our mayor, Mayor Eric Garcetti there on the right in the suit. And the gentleman who is speaking at the podium is a very special person to all of us at the LA Public Library. His name is Sergio Sanchez and he's a a person who became a citizen of the US using the services of the library. He's from Veracruz, Mexico, and he and his wife uh, became citizens. And when we won the medal uh, that uh, was mentioned in, in the introduction, uh, and, and we were able to receive that medal for museum and library service at the White House uh, many, many years ago, uh, we had to identify one patron of all the people that we serve in the big city of Los Angeles, one person who exemplified the impact that our library had on the communities we serve. And I tell you, that was a really tough thing. And from our branch staff, this wonderful gentleman surfaced. And so we took Sergio Sanchez to the White House with us. And I still remember the ride in from Virginia where we stayed at the hotel, past the Lincoln Memorial, past the Washington Monument, pulling up uh, to the White House, going through security and to take this gentleman who had come to the US and had uh, immigrated and become a US citizen and, and to be able to be there in the White House and uh, to have uh, the First Lady present the medal to us and to pose for photographs. It was a real American story. Uh, and a real powerful uh, story about the, the impact of our library. So um, thank you for indulging me. With that. I was a little bit long on that story, but it's just a, a beautiful uh, story of the impact of our libraries. We also have a program called Health Matters. We partner, now we're not providing the flu shots and eye exams and dental exams and so forth, but we partner with local health organizations to provide these services at the library, recognizing that the library is a trusted institution. We're in every neighborhood of Los Angeles. And we're very approachable. We're much more approachable than lots of places and institutions and we're friendly. And, and when we are able to offer a flu shot, flu shots in our meeting room, or maybe on, it's on a, a special vehicle that the local public health department might have, individuals who might come just for the flu shot or just for the eye exam and glasses or just for the HIV test or a blood pressure screening or some other health program, they're going to learn about story time. They're going to learn that we have materials in Armenian or Farsi uh, or Yiddish or some other uh, language. They're going to learn that the library is for them, that the library card is free, that it's a dynamic place. And so there's a, a great strategic benefit to the library as well. Uh, and we're able to make a difference in some, uh, in some uh, really health disparities and other issues in our community. In the summer, recognizing that so many children who participate in our summer programs and summer reading program and all of that 
do not get the free lunches that they normally get um, if they're eligible for free lunch uh, at their schools. Uh, and if children over the summer don't get that nutrition, they are not going to retain the skills and that is going to affect their learning and affect them when they return to school in the fall. So making certain that they have access to that over the summer is really important. And so what better place to be able to offer those free summer lunches than the library? And so we work with the LA Regional Food Bank, we work with the school district as well, and we promote this. And uh, for one of the days during the summer, um, they get me to put on an apron and a hat and I serve, <laughs> I serve, I serve meals. So that's me. Uh, serving meals. And I tell you, talk about a, a wonderful experience. It really is great. And when we do the summer meals, we're also uh, doing puppet programs. We're doing story times. We're issuing free library cards. Again, promoting library services and using this as, a, as an opportunity. And then we also have something called The Source, which is uh, a program specifically targeting uh, people experiencing homelessness. And of course, this is an issue across the country. It's an enormous issue here in Los Angeles and certainly other parts of California. We do this through our central library and seven branches. And essentially what we're doing is we're saying, we have a meeting room, bring uh, uh, social service agencies, uh, VA, the VA, uh, the Department of uh, Driver Services with driver's licenses, local, uh, nonprofits serving uh, the community, homeless community, uh, public health, mental health, come to the library, set up a table, and we'll have sort of a one-stop shopping service uh, for uh, all of these services. And of course, someone who um, is, is um, experiencing homelessness, living on the street, uh, going to all of those different agencies and the transportation and time involved uh, can be challenging and daunting, and that can be a real barrier to accessing those services. So we're simply, we're not spending any budget dollars on this. We're simply saying the library is here. Um, we are here for everyone, and uh, let us provide these services. Let us provide a space. And so we get at each event, uh, it happens uh, once a month uh, at these libraries, we have 12 to 15 partner agencies that come, and there's also the opportunity to enter the individual into what's called the coordinated entry system, which is sort of a, a global case management system, so that the next time they present to one of these agencies, um, they'll know what services they've had before and, and how they can better help them. And so uh, again, it's a, a, a small way, but I would say a, a high impact way uh, that we're helping out with a, a very serious uh, and significant issue in our city. Uh, full steam ahead, I mentioned the science, technology, engineering, arts, and math programming. Uh, uh, here are uh, some of uh, images from uh, some of those programs. And we began several years ago by infusing this, the, uh, these subjects into our children's programming, uh, in addition to all the other uh, great uh, literature-based programs that we do. And one of the great outcomes of this is that 52% of the participants in these science and technology programs are girls. And uh, that is really addressing a real gender equity issue in those professions. Uh, uh, women are underrepresented in, in those professions. And so being able to present these subjects and, and present them in a very exciting and engaging way, uh, and that 52% of the participants are young girls is a really great thing. And uh, I hope that we will have physicists and astronauts and science, math professors and other uh, folks who work in those disciplines uh, coming out of, of this program. And we uh, love uh, collecting all of that data and sharing successes about those programs. The Octavia Lab is an example of that. The Octavia Lab is a sort of digital learning environment makerspace. And here our mayor is at the launch of that. Our mayor Garcetti is great about promoting the library card. He's holding it up there in the, the left-hand uh, photograph. And there we are cutting the ribbon. It's named after Octavia Butler. And for all of you uh, uh, great readers, and I know you all are, I, you may know the name Octavia Butler. She's a, a acclaimed, award-winning science fiction writer, uh, African-American uh, science fiction writer, real um, uh, uh, trailblazer uh, in that area, and uh, someone who was from Los Angeles and loved the Los Angeles Public Library and actually was on a city bus on her way to Central Library on that day in April of 1986 when the fire occurred and has actually written about her experience. And so uh, being a science fiction uh, writer, 
uh, what 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 better person and being an Angelino, someone from LA, what a, a better person to name this this lab after her. And so it's about a 3,000 or so square foot space. It's in our central library in the new wing. And it has a sound editing booth, a video editing booth. It has video editing software. It has a 3D printer, a green screen, really advanced technologies uh, for people to learn and for uh, everyone to be able to access. People go through an orientation to learn how to use it. Uh, but for the general public, this isn't available to them. And so we're really excited to be able to provide it. And it's, it's again, it fits in with the library's mission of lifelong learning uh, and to, to make certain that people have the tools that they need to learn uh, and to succeed. And, and we're really, really proud of this lab. This lab, by the way, at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, began making uh, face shields. Uh, and they produced thousands of face shields during the pandemic uh, on the 3D printers that were in that uh, lab. We actually borrowed some 3D printers for, from some other libraries in the area. And uh, our, our delivery drivers actually delivered those uh, face shields to area hospitals so that they were able to be used by healthcare workers. So a, a really interesting, great way for the library to serve uh, our public. And we also go old school too. Uh, these are three book bikes and three amazing outreach librarians who will take these book bikes to area uh, parades, festivals, um, uh, senior living communities. And inside of these, they, they're kind of like, uh, you know, the little ice cream <laughs> sales bikes. When they open up, uh, and you kind of see one of them open up there uh, on the upper right-hand corner with uh, the cutest little girl you could ever imagine sitting there with a little book. We use that photograph in virtually every presentation because it's so amazing. But um, these book bikes uh, give free books out to the public and our librarians will sign people up for library cards. So it's a great way of taking the library outside of the library, doing outreach, promoting the institution of the public library. And uh, what a great photograph. And in the background, of course, is the uh, amazing, uh, much photographed Los Angeles City Hall. And we also, instead of just using an ordinary library card, uh, a few years ago, we said, why not engage Los Angeles artists in designing limited edition library cards? And because we're a big city, when we do a limited edition library card, we actually do 100,000 of them. And they become very popular. And this is a gentleman who grew up in Los Angeles. Uh, he is uh, in the gray sweater next to the library card in the upper right-hand corner. His name is Gajin Fujita, a Japanese-American, grew up in Boyle Heights. And uh, when we selected him, we selected him because he is just this amazing Los Angeles artist. And it wasn't until we printed the library cards up and we were getting ready to do a, a big launch event with the mayor at one of our libraries that he told us his library story. And he actually, growing up in Boyle Heights, went to the Robert Louis Stevenson Branch Library and he told us, he said, you know, I remember this children's library and all of us have these library stories from our childhood. I remember the children's library and she was so wonderful and I went to story time and she encouraged me and she picked books out that she thought I would like. And she was a very important person to me as a child. And uh, it was also important because there weren't many Japanese uh, Americans in my neighborhood in Boyle Heights at that time. And she was Japanese. And uh, that meant a great deal to see someone like me working at the library. And we said, Japanese American, what, what was her name, by the way? And he said, her name was Pearl Yonazawa. And we said, Pearl, and Pearl still works at the Los Angeles Public Library today. She manages our Los Feliz uh, branch library. And uh, of course, we had, we then made certain that Pearl came to the launch of the event and Pearl is standing next to me and next to the large library card there. And so this was just another bonus story around uh, the library card. And the center photograph is a giant banner that we've hung on Central Library to promote this new library card. And then the first library card that we did was actually uh, designed by Shepard Ferry, who is a world-renowned artist. And he did this great stylized uh, image uh, in very much a Shepard Ferry style of our Central Library. And there he is the artist of our first art card, and Gajin Fujita, the gentleman I was just speaking of, who designed our second art card, 
uh, with a, a gentleman who wrote a book uh, about a special collection at the Los Angeles Public Library. His name is Josh Kuhn, and the, the, the collection was our autograph collection here at the library. But a uh, really great story around the art cards. And we're now thinking about what that third art card would be and what artists we might engage to do it. But it's a great way to get people excited about it. Uh, there are people who will come in just for that art card and then we, we are able to, to show them all the great things that the, the library offers. Um, this is Los Angeles. Uh, and we are, you know, are, never waste an opportunity to, uh, to use celebrities in our midst to promote the library. Uh, I hope you uh, recognize the, the person in the upper left-hand corner. That's Keanu Reeves. Uh, we were thrilled uh, to, to get that photo. And let me tell you, we've We've used that photo quite a few times. We tweeted it out and put it on Instagram and, and YouTube and every, all of our social media channels. And then in the middle, standing right in front of the what is the new uh, uh, fountain basin where the old well of the scribes was in the central library there in the background, uh, that is uh, Emilio Estevez, who uh, is a film director, actor, as you know, Martin Sheen's son, uh, and looking great holding that library card up. Um, I'll just mention um, uh, uh, Tay Diggs and then Dolores Huerta there at the bottom. And then of course, Clifford the Big Red Dog, uh, always a great uh, supporter of libraries. I mentioned infants earlier. We have a great program uh, called Read Baby Read. This is about making certain that moms and dads, caregivers understand how Im absolutely important it is to read to your baby. Uh, I think most of us know that, but everyone doesn't get that message. And uh, that is really important. And if you're not reading to your baby, that affects literacy skills, that affects their ability to be on grade level by the third grade, which is a huge determinant of high school graduation and future academic success. And so this program, uh, using some private money, uh, some fundraising that we do for it, to our library foundation to uh, give a, a diaper bag that says Read Baby Read on it. We now have special backpacks because dads and moms like backpacks. And it says Read Baby Read, Los Angeles Public Library. And we have uh, wonderful little t-shirts, which is the cutest thing on earth uh, to <laughs> call it, that says Little Bookworm. We have the materials in Spanish as well. We include a little uh, board book, might be Pat the Bunny, might be some other, uh, uh, Good Night Moon is one that we like to put in the, in the bags. Uh, you might be familiar with those books. And uh, this was a photograph, uh, or a couple of photographs from the launch. You see me there holding one of the bags. Uh, that was probably the most fun uh, I've ever had at, a, at an event at the library with all those wonderful babies and uh, promoting the importance of reading. We have an enormous Spanish-speaking collection, or a collection and, and an enormous Spanish-speaking population here in Los Angeles. Uh, we have, uh, as you can imagine, staff throughout the organization who speak Spanish, collections, programs uh, in Spanish, and we really want to make certain that uh, our Spanish-speaking community knows that the library is there for them. And so a few years ago, we began hosting the Los Angeles Libros Festival, and it is a, a family book festival with authors, publishers, um, story times, all in Spanish, all day. And we uh, have began doing it virtually last uh, fall for obvious reasons. And it has become a popular event the world over. We had participants from throughout the Spanish speaking world, throughout Latin America, Spain. And uh, it was really, uh, really exciting. And here you see our assistant city librarian, Susan Broman, cutting the ribbon and uh, many of our staff there who uh, organize that program. Uh, believe it or not, you can get an accredited online high school diploma at the library. Uh, we began offering that a number of years ago. We believe in doing, although it's all online and people complete these uh, diplomas, this is not a GED, it's actually an online high school diploma. It is for adults, uh, not, not teenagers. So for adults who dropped out of school, who want that high school diploma, who need it for a job, need it for a degree, uh, we do offer it. We've had uh, well over 500 graduates so far. This is from one of those graduation ceremonies back in fall of 2019. Uh, we we uh, are able to get the mayor sometimes uh, and, and others. And there is never a dry eye in the house. Uh, incredible stories. Every single one of these graduates has a powerful story. And uh, another, another great, very interesting, very unusual deliverable uh, of the LA Public Library. 
Um, making certain that every child uh, has a library card is really, really important. And so rather than just wait for mom, dad, grandparents to bring the young person in for a library card, which they absolutely can still do and, 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 and absolutely do on a regular basis, we wanted to automatically make certain that every child in our Los Angeles Unified School District, the second largest school district in the country, has a library card. And so we entered into an agreement with the a school district and now every child coming into the district whether they're coming in as a kindergartner or they're coming in as a high schooler automatically gets a library card and when we you know started in the early days of the pandemic knowing that every child had access to all of our digital resources with a library card was was really really important tessa is our um, great portal where uh, all our special collections many of our special collections photographs uh, menus uh, fruit crate labels, even travel posters are digitized and people can use this uh, to search it. You just need to go to the library's website uh, to, to find that. Uh, really, really uh, an important resource of the library. Tessa, by the way, is the name of one of our uh, 19th century city librarians. I'm the 20th city librarian. Uh, Tessa uh, Kelso was one of our librarians back uh, in the 1880s, 1890s. And uh, it is named after her, and that is her over on the left, sort of hovering <laughs> next to the Italian cypress. Uh, that's actually a, a painting there with uh, Tessa superimposed on it. Uh, you all will be interested in this because you love menus. You love, I think, nostalgia and, and restaurants. We have, if you can believe it, 17,000 restaurant menus uh, in our collection. And they go back to the you know, 20s, 30s, 40s. And we recently, um, a few years ago, did a book called To Live and Dine in LA that featured uh, all of these historic menus. So to go back to the Brown Derby, the Golden Pagoda, Spago, and to see, you know, back when prime rib was 35 cents and a cup of coffee was five cents is just really wonderful nostalgia. And also a great way to see how uh, beautiful menus were and, and, and great menu design. So I, I mentioned that just to, uh, highlight some of the great special collections that the library has. During the pandemic, recognizing that many um, older adults uh, were uh, isolated and the socialization that is offered when folks come into the library was, was just not achievable digitally, uh, we partnered with the Department of Aging, which you know, delivers meals to homebound uh, uh, older adults. And we took some images from our photo collection and we produced these five postcards. And we printed uh, thousands of them. And we had our staff who were at home write messages to um, uh, anonymous messages of support and uh, information, maybe a little note about what's on the different uh, cards. And these postcards were included in the meals that were delivered to these uh, at-home uh, uh, seniors. And so this is a, an upper left-hand corner is a senior who's received one of these postcards. And the lower right-hand corner is um, Lisa, one of our librarians who's holding up uh, the five uh, postcards that we produced. Here's just an example. Some of our staff actually did some uh, artwork on the cards and uh, the, uh, the box is uh, an example of uh, uh, one of the, the meals. Uh, our street fleet, uh, vehicles that do outreach, they actually delivered free books uh, that had been donated to the library to homeless shelters during the pandemic. Uh, this is some of our staff uh, doing a glamour shot with the street fleet before uh, the pandemic hit. And then we couldn't do any of this without the incredible staff of the library. And back in 2018, we had a staff development day where we closed all of our libraries and brought all of our staff together in one place for a series of professional development activities and programs. And of course, we have so many staff, we couldn't do it at any of our libraries. We had to do it at, of all places, the convention center. And this is the best photo we could get of as many of our staff in one shot as possible. Um, and uh, in the front there, you see uh, next to me and one of our librarians is a, the most gorgeous dog you can ever imagine. The dog's name is Ghost. And it was a, a support dog of uh, one of our staff. And, honestly a highlight of the day. Love, love, love ghost. And then in conclusion, I just show this photo again because it's, uh, it's, uh, it's what we're all about, you know, putting books into the hands of children 
is uh, an, a mighty important mission and, and making certain that there is a lifelong love of, of reading. We wanna start as early as we possibly can with the Read Baby Read program and make certain that people know that the library is there for them. And uh, just back to the library book, Susan Orlean's book I think has done that. One of the things that I hear from so many people is that I had no idea the library did that. I'm so delighted to learn that the library is still alive doing great things. Uh, many people know that from their own experience because they're using us. Uh, but honestly, for many people reading that book, which was a bestseller and reached people all over the world, has been translated into multiple languages. Um, it, it carried that message of public libraries are uh, essential organizations to the communities they serve, whether they're serving a town of a thousand people or a big city like Los Angeles with over four million. And uh, uh, I couldn't be prouder. And I, I hope you can tell I kind of love this work and feel very passionate about it. And uh, it's an honor to, to talk about libraries with all of you and an honor to talk about the library book. And I hope you all enjoyed it. And I, I would just love to answer any questions you have or hear what your thoughts are on it and hear your library stories. Um, yeah. First of all, thank you so much, um, Mr. Sabo, for, I mean, this really fascinating and wow, what a place, I mean, this library is. I mean, it was really fascinating. And um, yeah, I have actually a question for you. I mean, if I may ask that I'll first, um, this well of the scribes, I mean, so now you have half of it or about half of it, I assume, right? I mean, yes. um, um, have you ever thought about like rebuilding it? I mean, rebuilding the other part? Yes, and I think that, um, you know, in the gardens now, there is a, a garden design and a public art design and a an, uh, landscape architect and an artist that was uh, commissioned to actually create the, the new garden. So um, we definitely would like to do that. We, we likely would not put the new well in the place of where it was before. Mm -hmm. We would find a new area somewhere, either on the building's exterior or perhaps even interior. I think we're very open-minded about that. My hope and, and dream is that the remaining pieces will be found. There is a, an equivalent size piece uh, that comes from the other side, a small piece oh, in the dear. middle, and then that little spout uh, that was on the wall also. But um, if we're not able to do that, we've talked about how this one piece might be able to be publicly displayed so that everyone can enjoy it and see it. Yeah, let these attend because we construct it from photo. Any, any other questions? I, I have a question. I, I actually a comment. I've already been into the library in the last couple of weeks and I was almost hyperventilating with joy of being in a library, which I'm sure everybody can relate to. My question is about the neighborhood where the library is for us Northern Californians who don't know LA. Can you describe the neighborhood where the main library is, how it, maybe how it was when it was first built and now? Yes, um, and, and I, I love and appreciate that you uh, call it a neighborhood because it, it very much is a neighborhood and uh, it, it's, it's easy to think about us being in the middle of all of these skyscrapers and hotels and uh, bank buildings and all, but uh, it is a neighborhood and there are people that live here and uh, children that live here and, and we are the neighborhood lie, even though this is a almost 600,000 square foot library, we are the neighborhood library for downtown LA. So the Central Library is in the uh, heart of downtown Los Angeles. We are immediately across the street from uh, the, the tallest building west of the Mississippi, uh, the U.S. Bank Building, which interestingly, uh, and another program another time, but it, it was, uh, has a very close history with um, the L.A. Public Library. For many, many years, that, that 73-story building was known as the Library Tower, and the reason was that we sold the air rights for our property to the developers of that building. And they also built the, the parking garage that I mentioned. And so there was this, this very unique kind of a arrangement with that developer. Um, we have the Weston uh, uh, Bonaventure Hotel, the historic Biltmore Hotel uh, around us. So it is a very uh, dynamic uh, part, of, uh, part of the heart of downtown Los Angeles. And we are used by business people were used and visited by many tourists from all around the world who visit uh, downtown Los Angeles. There's a very large, as you uh, can imagine, uh, population of people experiencing homelessness who uh, were not that far from Skid Row. 
who use us on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, and we're, we're a bit of a distance from the uh, City Hall. We're a few blocks from Walt Disney Concert Hall, but uh, a, a very rich uh, urban environment. Mm -hmm. And back in 1926, Bunker Hill was across the street from us, this incredible neighborhood of Victorian homes. And there was an original design actually of a, a bridge that con connected the library's rotunda on the second floor with Bunker Hill. And uh, in the 60s, 70s, Bunker Hill was essentially leveled to build a whole community of residential and commercial buildings, sadly. Uh, but uh, sort of part of Bunker Hill is still there and some steps that, uh, that go up to that area. Oh, thank so, you. And thank you for your passion and information that you shared with us. So you, you said at the beginning um, that you were very excited and a little nervous about um, what Susan Orlean would write about the library. Is there anything that she put in the book that she didn't get right? <laughs> um, oh, that's a tough question and a good question. Yeah, um, I was really, well, I was, you know, she's this best-selling author and, you know, I was like, what, what dirt is she going to uncover about the library? And, you know, I'm, I'm the city librarian. I, the reputation of this institution, the buildings, the people, the staff, the re everything is sort of, and I, I don't want any of that harmed. And so that's what I was sort of, you know, nervous about what she was going to, to uncover and, um, and it, it all turned out beautifully. I, the only thing I can think of, and I mention this uh, sometimes when I talk about the book, that she didn't get right is she she refers to my head as being a square shape, and I take issue with that. I mean, <laughs> I don't think I have a square shaped head, um, but um, she did she did get it right, and she uh, they she, they had the publisher had fact checkers and called us. Even the the gentleman who translated the book into uh, Chinese call to really truly understand some nuances around some library terminology and I really appreciated the fact that that they do that to make certain that they even get the translations right. Um, I, there are some people that have taken issue with how she, she characterized some uh, people who used to work here and things like that but uh, I thought she did so with great great humor and and also I think a great deal of affection. It was very obvious that she had an affection for the institution and she kind of did a nice job of telling the history of libraries and and also a lot about fire itself any other questions so i have a question yeah. okay who was that well i i read the, i read the book a few years ago and honestly i don't remember did they ever figure out what caused the fire well, uh, yeah, um, the, well, the, the short answer to that is really no. Uh, ah. Everyone has their opinion. And one of the, one of the you know, things that I, and I would say hoped for was that Susan in the book would uh, be very definitive about who started the fire and what, you know, here's where the facts lead us and, and all. And I, I, that's really not the case. I don't think we really know. Ah. I think it's... It's, uh, you know, I think most believe it was arson. Um, and of course, Harry Peak, uh, the very fascinating character who, uh, who was arrested for the fire. Uh, and then later it was determined that he was just sort of uh, larger than life telling stories and so forth that uh, it was believed that he didn't start the fire. There are many who believe that he did, um, but um, uh, the, the short answer is no. I don't think it is uh, conclusive as to what exactly happened and what started it. Mm. I, I love the book, though. It brought back all those memories of mm. every other Saturday when my father would take us to the library and I would go home feeling so rich with a whole stack of books. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's wonderful. You know, I think it did that for Susan personally, too. I mean, I, she, being an author, she loved libraries naturally. She loves books and she's part of that space. But it wasn't until she began working on this book that she really started thinking about and connecting with her own library story uh, back in uh, Northeast Ohio and all those memories of going to the library and really stopping and thinking about how important that was to her uh, during her formative years. Mm. Uh, that's, that's, that's important for all of us to do and to remember those early library stories. Question. Is the library on Twitter? Oh yes, we 
We are on uh, uh, every social media. We are on um, uh, Instagram, uh, YouTube. Uh, we're on um, yeah all social media platforms. We have a very, very big Twitter following, big Twitter presence, uh, Facebook. In fact, I have some news uh, to share about the library and social media. Um, earlier this month, we launched um, Asian American Pacific American uh, Pacific Islander Heritage Month. And we did so with a, uh, a mini concert at our Cypress Park Branch Library in Northeast Los Angeles. And we did it with a group of teenage girls who have a band. And this band is known as the Linda Lindas. And they sang a song and uh, the video of that song we posted last week and it went viral. Every now and then we have a, a post that goes viral. And uh, this went so viral that it became our number one post across all of our social media. So it, it uh, <coughs> passed uh, the, the Keanu Reeves post, uh, which was our number one uh, post on Instagram. It surpassed a post that we had with RuPaul when RuPaul was at the library, on, which was our YouTube record. And uh, it also surpassed our Twitter record, which was Amanda Gorman. The inaugural poet uh, was someone who grew up in the Los Angeles Public Library, became the Youth Poet Laureate of Los Angeles right here in this building on stage. And so we very much are connected to her and have lots of photographs of her at the library. And our tweet about her had been our number one post since January. But now this young group uh, of uh, Asian American and Latino girls who form this band uh, are, is our all time record. So we are on a high right now in the social media space. So forget, forgive the long answer, but I had to, to put that <laughs> plug in there for, for our social media folks to just do a great job. I'm sure I've seen it, although it wasn't it wasn't from you. It had been passed on so that the LA Public Library had been lost in it. But the the video is terrific. The girls are great. Yeah, well, well and 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 they got a record deal. They got a record deal with Epitaph <laughs> Records. So um, I, I I joke, you know, I, I hope we get a cut of the proceeds. We're so not going to get a cut of the proceeds, but. I'm thrilled that, that, you know, this was featured in Variety. It was in the New York Times. It was on NPR. I mean, it, it is just, they are, they are big now. And I, you know, just like Amanda Gorman has a modeling contract and she was at the Super Bowl and she's just become huge. And uh, I wish all the best for the Linda Lindas. They deserve all of the success, but uh, I sure wish we got a little cut of <laughs> the, the money they're going to be making. I have a memory for you. I grew up in LA and I remember taking the bus down to the library from where we had bought a house in, in West LA. Mm. And I worked at the Baldwin Hills Library in the early 1960s shelving oh. books. How wonderful. Oh, I love that story. That's great. We wow. are devotees of libraries everywhere. Oh, that is great to hear. I love that. You worked at the Baldwin Hills Library. That's wonderful. And I love stories about people who came downtown on the bus. Yeah, me. <laughs> That's really great. I was a bus traveler. That's so great. We still have lots of young people, teens who take the train. Uh, we have a great space exclusively for teens here at the library. And of course, the, the children's library is one of the most beautiful spaces in our building. Uh, but um, but, but we, we love that. People come from all over the city. And we were good friends with the Seagulls who were librarians in the 60s. Ah, oh, that's wonderful. Goes back a ways. Definitely. <laughs> and Oliver worked at the bindery at the UCLA library. Oh, no. oh OK. Wonderful. Terrific. I have a question. Are, are we just raising our hands? Diane, yeah, Diane. Trying. <laughs> Diane and yeah. Diane. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, this is really wonderful. I'm a library lover from when I was a kid, went every Saturday. Um, my question is different though. Um, I'm so impressed with all the programs that the library offers. And I'm wondering, are you, I, I don't know, in touch with, do you know about other major libraries in the country 
which have anywhere near this amount of, you know, connections between the health, the health and the feeding and, you know, just all that whole range that touches on, on social services and educating parents and voting and, you know, all those things that a library should do. Sure. How, that's common, a, how common is it? That's a great, great question. And, uh, you know, we, we are very proud of how creative and innovative our services are. And, you know, LA is a very special place. And uh, I, you know, I've, I've been here almost nine years. And one of the things I find so invigorating here is that sort of any crazy idea can take root. You know, it, it is a place that sort of is more apt to say, yeah, let's try that as opposed to, no, we did that, you know, 15 years ago, let's not try it again, or let's not do that. Um, yes, uh, librarians are wonderful about sharing and, uh, ideas and, and building off of each other. Uh, those of us who lead large public libraries across the country are very connected. So, you know, you name a big American city, I, I know the person that leads the library in Austin, Texas, or, you know, Houston or Chicago or New York or Seattle or Charlotte or Atlanta or wherever. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we do learn from each other. And I will say each of those libraries are doing things that would wow you all and that we are not doing. And we're doing things that would wow them. And so it's, uh, it's really about what talents do we have and what our community needs are. But yes, uh, really amazing things are happening at libraries all across the country. And I always like to tell our staff, it's not just with a big library like ours, it's, it's easy to say, oh, we're so cool and amazing and we do all the cool stuff and we don't have a lot to learn from elsewhere because we do all this amazing stuff. And I'm, I'm a big believer in, in staying connected, not just with the big public libraries around the country and really around the world, but also small libraries as well. They're doing really creative things. And I believe we all can learn from each other. And there are some really wonderful um, digital resources and uh, you know publications in the world of libraries where we share things. Uh, I will say that the public library folks, you know, learn from each other and the, they're the academic library folks and different types of libraries, but we also can learn between different types of libraries as well. Uh, but yeah, I'd say we're, we're very, very connected and, uh, and are all about sharing ideas and we're usually not territorial about copying ideas and things like that. So um, <laughs> great. Thanks. Um, yeah, libraries are about sharing, you know, sharing and lending. Mary? Um, yeah, I, I um, am really interested in these educational programs you have from Read to Your Baby, every kid who uh, registers in their public school gets a card, all of those. And I'm an, I, a humble Richmond here and really keen about expanding uh, the literacy. You, you know, do you have a liaison person in your library who just focuses on developing these programs or does it come through each um, kind of subdivision within? The, I mean, how, how, what's a good way to go about uh, affecting that in a smaller library system or how do you do it basically? Sure, sure. Well, um, given our size, we're a little unique. We, we have a, a special office or division and, and it's one that actually we've created since since I was here, just because of that need to coordinate. There's certain major initiatives that we want to make certain are infused throughout the organization and need to be led sort of centrally, and like the New Americans Initiative, like the work around health and so forth. So we have a special office that's actually called Engagement and Learning. And all of our uh, children's programming, teen programming, immigrant uh, programs for immigrants, the homeless, veterans, our adult literacy program, our language learning uh, classes, all of those things are part of that division. So it just depends on, uh, you know, which of those programs we have a point person for them. And, uh, and then we also want to empower our branches. Uh, we, we don't want our branches to be cookie cutter. So the branch that serves Watts is going to have a different sort of suite of programs and services as the one at Canoga Park or Sherman Oaks or Studio right. City. And so we want to give some flexibility to the libraries and those libraries to be creative and come up with their own programs. But we also have the overarching major initiatives. So it just depends. And in a, in a smaller library, it might be the li frontline librarian or the manager or branch manager or director who might lead, uh, lead that work. Um, right. Have a liaison. 
yeah, and liaison with the school district or whatever, even a volunteer, I suppose, could do that. Yeah, exactly. And I will say that this, the school district piece, you know, um, that is, that is honestly, it's a miracle uh, because, you know, we're a big bureaucracy. We're within a city of LA. We're all part of the city of LA here at the library. We're a department of the city. That's a big bureaucracy. The school district is a behemoth bureaucracy. And, you know, when you come up with a creative idea like, hey, let's figure out a way to make certain every child gets a library card and that we're, sh which of course sounds easy, but it means it involves legal issues. It involves confidentiality issues, privacy issues, I technology issues, sharing data issues. And there are 152 ways not to do it. There are all barriers. So to be able to do it really requires, you know, some political leadership and people to say, we got to make this happen. Um, and we got to get through all of the barriers because the children are just that important. And uh, so I'd say it's really hard in a big organization and, uh, and certainly could be challenging in a smaller one. But uh, yes, a, a, a board president, a library director, a superintendent could absolutely work to make that happen. And we like helping other libraries and other communities to make that happen too. We have a person, we get lots of calls about how to do it with the school district. And we have a person that works with, uh, works with that and is in charge of nothing but that initiative. Wow, thank you. Yeah, thank you. you're helpful. Mm -hmm. Do you have a lot of volunteers? We do, we absolutely do. We have a, a, a volunteer engagement office. We have about uh, 6,000 or so volunteers who help with children's programs, who help with literacy. Uh, many of them are part of Friends of the Library organizations. I'm sure you all have heard of those types of groups before. Uh, many, but not all of our branch libraries have a Friends of group. So there's a Friends of the Brentwood Library, a Friends of the Eagle Rock Library. And even some of our special collections like rare books and photos here at Central Library have their own friends groups. And so many volunteers are volunteers with those friends groups. And one of the big activities of many of those friends groups is that they collect donated books and then they have book sales and they sell those books for you know, 25 cents or a dollar. And then those dollars benefit the branch library or benefit the special collection. So yes, we love volunteers. Okay, I guess. Um, may, may I ask one more question? Sue, mm -hmm. Sue yes. Are, 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 are you aware of Orkney Library? I am. I, I can't believe someone asked me about Orkney Library. I am the Orkney Islands. And I'm also familiar with, uh, are you talking about in Scotland? Yes. Yeah. And, uh, and the Shetland uh, Library are two of the most wonderful libraries and they have the most amazing social media people it, it, of all the libraries in the world if i were to recommend uh five libraries to follow on twitter orkneys would be one of them <laughs> they have twice as many twitter followers as yes. LA public libraries. i know i know can you there believe are only twenty two thousand people in orkney i know I know, and, and we absolutely love them, and they are brilliant and clever, and uh, I can't say enough nice things. And also, interestingly, the National Library of Scotland is just as wonderful as the Orkneys and Shetland, too. They're all just so clever, and uh, yes, anybody who knows libraries on Twitter um, definitely knows what you're talking about. Thank you for bringing those up. I love that. Okay, so I guess... Um... That is it for today. Thank you, thank you, thank you again, um, Zabo. I mean, it was wonderful and it was really also very um, interesting, I mean, to learn what your library does. I mean, besides the fact that, I mean, about the fire, et cetera. So um, thank you everybody who stayed with us. I mean, I'm, I'm actually thrilled we had, I mean, about 25, 26 people. So that's actually pretty good and um, yeah. Um, I hope to see you all again. Thank, Thank you, you all so much. And I, I really appreciate all your uh, comments and great questions. And uh, really, really love that. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. And support your public library. Yes. <laughs> Have a wonderful day. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.